So let's imagine that you're in the wild. You have no equipment to catch fish. You don't know how to make any traps. And you have no experience in hunting. What do you turn to for food? The answer is most likely what is easily available to you at that immediate time. The chances are that this will be plants, trees and fungi, depending on your location obviously. Once you delve into the world of plants and fungi, you will be surprised at just how much of what you see in day to day life is edible. You also might be surprised by just how similar these plants might be to their toxic counterparts. In this video, I'm not only going to show you a number of wild edible plants, but I'll also give you information on the medicinal value of these plants and how they might contribute to you thriving when out in the wild. They might even help you if you end up in a survival situation. So without further ado, let's crack on. Yellow Archangel, or Lamiastrum galeobdalon, is a perennial spreading plant of the Lamaceae family, the same family as mint. It looks similar to that of the dead nettle, and that's because it's in the same family. It produces bright yellow hooded flowers from May through to the end of June. The leaves are in opposite pairs, and as with many other plants in the Lamaceae family, the stem is actually square, and you should be able to see that in this shot here. Both the leaves and the flowers are edible raw, but mature plants would taste better if steamed, lightly cooked, or steeped in a tea. Its medicinal uses include being an effective remedy for sleeplessness, cleansing the blood, and helping to alleviate stomach and abdominal cramps. The leaves and flowers have also been used to treat kidney disorders and bladder malfunctions. Overall, it looks pretty gnarly and poisonous, but it's actually a damn good wild edible. Keep an eye out for it in shady areas of woodland, especially on wayside verges. The Pignut, Conopodium magus, arguably one of the best wild edibles out there in terms of nutrition. There's much more to this little plant that meets the eye. The leaves are very fine, almost frilly and twice pinnate. They look similar to that of carrot when young. However, this little beauty is part of the Apiaceae family, which houses the type of plants that can kill you with just a few swallowed leaves. It's fairly easy to identify once you spot these distinctive frilly leaves, usually found in shaded deciduous woodlands amongst other small plants like bluebells, dog's mercury and brambles. But it's not what is above the ground that we are looking to eat, it's what lies underneath. If you get a small sturdy stick and dig away at the base of the stem, being careful not to snap it off. Eventually, you will come across the small tuber, which looks like a nut. It's usually a similar size to the hazelnut. If you brush off the outer skin, you'll have yourself a fine wild edible that tastes a little bit like hazelnut and celery combined. It's one of my favorite wild foods. However, a few things to note. Firstly, it's to make sure that you have the whole plant out of the ground, with leaves and tuber attached. That way, you can be certain that you have correctly identified it. If you end up snapping the stem when you dig it up, but still manage to get the nut, I personally would avoid eating it, as you may have dug up a neighbouring bluebell bulb, which is poisonous, or even a lesser celandine tuber, which can also be toxic if not prepared and cooked properly. The second thing to add, is that in the UK, under the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, it is actually illegal to uproot a plant without the landowner's permission. Luckily, I am the landowner, so I gave myself permission to uproot this little specimen just for you guys. The common dog violet, or Viola rivignana, is hands down one of the prettiest wild edibles around. It's native to Europe, North Africa and Western Asia, but is now found in many more countries in the Northern Hemisphere. It tends to be found in shady deciduous woodland, and will often be next to the previous wild edibles that I just showed you. It has a heart-shaped leaf that is smooth and has prominent veins. As the name suggests, the flower is a violet colour, which gets richer as the spring develops and gets more sunshine. Interestingly, the lower petal of the flower has dark veins running through it, and a key identification feature of this plant is the prominent spur that is protruding out of the back of the flower. This is often a lighter colour than the petals, and if you look really closely, it has a tiny notch in the end of it. Both the leaves and flower are edible, 
and contain high levels of vitamin C. Often, the flowers have been made into a syrup or dried and infused in a tea. One thing to add with dog violet, and in fact any flowering plant, is to be sure to forage responsibly. Many species of butterflies and bees use these flowers throughout spring and summer, and so it's important not to over forage one particular area. Be sure to leave flowers behind to help with regeneration and continue biodiversity within the woodland ecosystem. Greater Stitchwort, Stellaria holostea, is another common flowering plant which is edible, often found in woodlands, but also in fields by the edges of woodlands. At first glance, it looks like the white flower has 10 petals, but it is in fact a five petal plant. It's just the petals are deeply divided by a prominent lobe. Before they flower, they can be tricky to spot, as at first glance, they just look like grass. But if you look closely, the leaves are long, thin and lance shaped and arranged in opposite pairs, with each pair at 90 degrees to the pair below. If you feel the stem, it is slightly rough to the touch. Both the leaves and petals are edible. They go well in a salad or boiled or steamed. It has a number of medicinal values, not least of which is what it can be linked to in its name, stitchwort. It was historically used in a herbal remedy to treat the pain in the side after vigorous exercise, which is known as a stitch. Bluebells, an iconic sign of spring in many of Britain's ancient woodlands. As pretty as it is, all parts of this plant are toxic, but if you watch carefully as the camera pans the woodland flora, you might be able to spot a different flower amongst the sea of bluebells. Can you see it? Just there. With striking dark pink and purple bell flowers, it might be mistaken for a mutated bluebell variety, but it's not. This is in fact an early purple orchid, Orchid mascula. As its name suggests, it is one of the first orchids to flower in spring. In peak growing season, it can display up to 50 purple flowers, which are arranged in a cone-shaped cluster on a tall spike. Each flower has three lobes on the lower lip, and the upper petals form a hood. The leaves are glossy dark green with black spots on them, and they form from a rosette on the ground. Historically, the roots or tuber was cooked and ground into a powder, which was known as salep or salep which was a nutritious drink. It was also used as a treatment for gastrointestinal problems. However, these plants are under threat from the loss of grassland habitats to farming and the destruction of woodlands. It's also arguably one of the best looking wild flowers, so I would advise leaving this one alone. Glecoma heterosea, or ground ivy, is an evergreen perennial plant that grows in dappled shaded woodlands and hedgerows. From around March time, you will start to see small purple flowers, and as it is part of the mint family, it has an aromatic smell and gives off a distinct aroma when you crush the leaves. The shape of the leaves are fairly distinct. They have a heart shape with clear serrations around the edge. The name ground ivy can be linked to the way in which it grows, which is of course along the ground. It's an edible plant and works best when made in a tea. It has many medicinal properties including the treatment of sore throat, blocked nose and sinus issues. An effective way to relieve sinus pain is to steep the leaves in hot water and breathe in the vapours. And here's a cool fact. Historically, the herb was the most common flavouring in beer prior to the use of hops from the 16th century onwards. Aduga reptans, carpet bugleweed, common bugleweed or just bugle for short. It is also a member of the Lamiaceae family, the same as that of mint. It's a perennial plant, usually found in deciduous woodlands, and can grow in both shaded or sunny areas of the woods. Both the leaves and shoots are edible, however, this plant has been more commonly used externally for the treatment of wounds. It has been used in arresting hemorrhages and for the treatment of coughs. It contains substances that are commonly found in the digitalis plants, which have been used in treating heart complaints. More often than not, it is used as a homeopathic remedy to create medicated oils and ointments. It has also been widely used to combat throat irritations, especially mouth ulcers. It's a funky looking plant, which has a pillar-like structure. Small blue flowers emerge in the early spring from May 
and goes on to flower through to July. It uses stolons or runners to spread across the forest floor, hence the name carpet bugle. Aliara petiolata, or garlic mustard. It's a very common hedgerow and woodland wild edible that is part of the Brassicaceae family. It also goes by the name of Jack by the Hedge and has distinctive heart-shaped leaves that are clearly toothed and deeply lobed where the leaf meets the stem. It is generally a light or luscious green and stands out amongst other plants on the woodland floor. When crushed, the leaves give off a mild garlic scent and when eaten raw, they are slightly bitter with a little kick of mustard. They are great when stuffed in fish or meat and cooked over the fire. Come April time, you will notice small white flowers emerging from the top of the plant. These are also edible and tend to give a much stronger flavour than the leaves. The leaves themselves can be finely chopped and added to salads, and as the leaves emerge very early in the year, they can be a great late winter edible. Historically, the plant has been used as a herbal medicine to treat asthma, bronchitis and eczema. The roots can also be chopped up and heated in oil to make an ointment to rub on the chest in order to bring relief from bronchitis. Here's a plant that many of you will be familiar with, wild garlic or Allium ursinum, or ramsums as they are more commonly known. It is arguably one of the most potent wild edibles around. You will come across the young shoots in late winter and early spring, and you'll often smell them before you see them. Most of the time, you will have trampled on a young shoot without even realising, and you'll catch the faint aroma of garlic. It's fairly easy to identify with its lance-shaped, smooth green leaves. The most obvious identification is to crush the leaves to get the overpowering smell of garlic. It tends to cover large areas of the woodland floor. All parts of this plant are edible, leaves, roots and flowers. The flowers tend to have a much stronger kick of garlic than the leaves. Medicinally, the plant helps to reduce high blood pressure and lower cholesterol levels. They are also known to ease stomach pain and aid in the treatment of diarrhoea, colic, indigestion and a loss of appetite. It's a damn fine wild edible and it's usually common and widespread at this time of year. However, it does share close similarities with lily of the valley, Convalaria majalis. The leaves are extremely similar and they can grow amongst each other. The best way to tell them apart is that lily of the valley tends to have two or three leaves attached to the stem, whereas ramsons only have one leaf attached to the base of the stem. The flowers of lily of the valley are more bell-shaped and tend to droop over, whereas the white flowers of ramsons are clustered at the end of an upright stem. Now, this tiny clover-looking plant is not actually clover, but it is without doubt one of the coolest wild edibles around. Wood sorrel, or Oxalis acetacella, packs a serious punch for its size. It has heart-shaped trifolate leaves, is often a luscious light green and stands out amongst other green plants on the forest floor. It extends by rhizomes under the ground. In spring, it sends up a white flower with a purple vein. It's pretty common amongst the other plants, but the taste it gives is pretty incredible. When you first chew into the leaves of this plant, it doesn't give you much in terms of flavour, but wait a few seconds, and before you know it, you'll be hit with a citric blast that tastes similar to that of apple peel, but without the bitterness. It's a cracking wild edible, and can be great added into salads or just eaten straight raw. The citrus kick that it gives off is down to the oxalic acid that it contains. It's important to note that this oxalic acid forms calcium oxalate crystals. Your body produces oxalate on its own from food, as you convert vitamin C into oxalate when your body metabolizes. Once eaten, the oxalate binds the minerals to form compounds, which mostly happens in your colon, but can happen in the kidneys. Most people will eliminate these compounds in their urine or stools, but to some people, this can cause an increased risk of kidney stones. So, to put it bluntly, if you have ever suffered with kidney stones, this is one to probably avoid, but in small doses, this plant is a really tasty wild edible throughout the spring. One of the safest wild edibles for beginners looking to get into foraging is that of the bramble plant, Rubus fruticosus. It's easy to identify, with its serrated leaves and long winding stems that are full of spiky thorns. 
In late autumn, it produces the delicious blackberry fruit, which contains malic and citric acid. Historically, it had been dried, crushed into a powder, and was a reliable remedy for dysentery. In early spring, the new emerging shoots are also a very useful edible. They can be eaten raw or steeped in a tea, which also has the same effect as the berries, providing a remedy for dysentery. Not only that, but if you remove the thorns from the stems, this can now be used as cordage, and when prepared correctly, it can create a strong bind when tied in knots or wrapped on itself. This one hardly needs an introduction. I'm pretty certain almost all of you watching will be able to identify or relate to this plant. It is, of course, the infamous stinging nettle, Urtica dioca. This really is one of the best survival plants out there. It's easy to identify with its arrow-shaped leaves, which grow in opposite pairs and have serrated edges. When you look at it closely, you can see tiny little white hairs. These act as a hypodermic needle, which upon contact can inject histamine into your skin, which will cause itching. This is why taking an antihistamine can help relieve nettle rash. Nettles have been used as a herbal remedy for thousands of years. They contain a number of micronutrients, including vitamin C and B, phosphorus, magnesium, iron, calcium, and more. Historically, nettles were thought to have been used by ancient Egyptians, who used the plant as an infusion for the relief of arthritis. These days, it is still used as a herbal remedy. To eliminate the sting from the plant, blanch it out by holding it over the heat of a fire briefly. This will burn off those hypodermic needles. You can then either eat it raw, or I find it's best steeped into a tea to get the most out of the medicinal value of the plant. It's also great when made as a soup. The stem can be divided, split down and made into cordage. Overall, this is near the top of the list for survival plants. I often get asked, how come sometimes I can touch nettles and they sting you, and other times I touch them, they don't? That's because there are a number of different types of nettle. Here's an example. This is Lemium album, the white dead nettle. Native to Europe and Asia, it likes similar soil conditions as the stinging nettle, which is why it is often found in the same area. A key identification of this species is the white flowers that emerge during the spring. The flowers form at leaf nodes on the stem, which you don't get with the stinging nettles. This is a key giveaway that it is in fact a dead nettle, and that it won't give you the sting that a stinging nettle would. It has similar medicinal properties to the stinging nettle. It can be eaten raw or cooked. It's often better as a herbal tea. The dandelion is arguably one of the most common springtime plants that you will see. With its bright yellow compound flowers and very distinctive sawtooth leaves. In fact, the name dandelion is derived from the French term don de lion, meaning tooth of the lion. This relates to its toothed edges, which you can see on this particular leaf here. The leaves also have a prominent white vein on the underside. The leaves, flower and roots of this plant are edible. It has a high medicinal value, with vitamin A, vitamin B1, vitamin B2 and vitamin C all present. Historically, it was a very common herbal remedy. It was especially effective and valuable as a diuretic, as it contains a high level of potassium salts, and therefore it can replace the potassium that is lost from the body when diuretics are used. The roots can be dried and ground down to be used as a coffee substitute. The plant has also been used in the treatment of gallbladder and urinary disorders. The plant also has a milky sap, which contains latex. The latex has a specific action on inflammation of the gallbladder, and has also been believed to remove stones in the liver. Like many wild plants, the leaves can also be steeped in a tea. I had much fun with this plant throughout my childhood, known commonly as cleavers, goosegrass or sticky weed. It has tiny hair-like hooks on the leaves, which means that as you throw it at your mate's clothing, it will stick to it. Great fun when your mate has their back turned to you, and they spend the rest of the day walking around with a plant on their back. Its Latin name is Gallium aparine. It's a pretty unique looking plant, which grows in shaded woodland as well as hedgerows. The leaves grow in rosettes up the stem, and almost look like miniature fireworks going off. They are thin, oblong, and full of tiny hairs. 
they are a good source of wild edibles in the late winter. They aren't very palatable eaten raw, as the hairs give it a rough texture, but when blanched or steeped in water, or even steamed, they are much more palatable. It does produce small white flowers later in the year. Goosegrass has a long history of medicinal use, and is still used by modern day herbalists. It is a diuretic, and used to treat skin problems such as eczema and psoriasis. It has also been used as a general detoxifying agent in more serious illnesses such as cancer. It's a great edible, and it's very common and easy to identify. And there you have it, just a small variety of wild edible plants that just might help you out in a survival situation. Of course there are more, and some more important ones which I have deliberately missed out of this episode, but will cover in another one soon. Just as a disclaimer, I am not advising you to go and pick and eat these wild plants, but if you do, I would advise that you take a field guide with you and cross-reference all plants before you do ingest them. I'd also advise that you go on a foraging course with a professional, as they can give you hands-on advice with plants there and then. Keep in mind that for some of these plants, there are toxic counterparts which look very similar. I will cover some of these in an episode soon. If you enjoyed this video and topics like this, please feel free to subscribe and to watch more videos like it, follow the link to my Wilderness Survival Skills playlist in the video description below. Cheers for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.